Before we formally start, I would like to request Mr. T R Dua, Chairman ITU APT, and also DG Taipa to offer a salt to Rajiv Malhotra ji. <laughs> Friends, in the history of our association, Tima CMI, this is the first time we are able to host such a VIP, well-known author. Rajiv Malhotra ji and co-author Vijay Vishwanathan ji. We have been talking in India for AI for so many years and he came out with a book AI Future of Power long back and today, I mean last week or so, there is another book released called Snakes in Gangaj. He speaks very nicely of the AI and also how the world is bringing up narratives against India if I can say so and how we are supporting that. That is in brief uh, about him. Now we request uh, Bakluji to say. Last year beginning, that was 21 beginning, I uh, came across this book called Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Power by Rajivji. And that is the time I realized that how ignorant I still am because the points which I had not thought about uh, those all issues were covered here, which uh, uh, I mean, maybe I would have thought about it the day after, but he had thought about it yesterday. And uh, that, that was the reason at uh, ITU APD Foundation, we organized a webinar where it was on artificial intelligence. I invited uh, Rajiji for that. And it was a very successful session and appreciated by one and all. So... Uh, after that, Rajiji was supposed to come here uh, in uh, August, September last year, but due to some personal reasons, he couldn't manage. But in the meantime, uh, you know, now that I had gone through this book and I felt now I have a lot of knowledge about what the challenges of artificial intelligence are, because there are five battlegrounds he has mentioned here. He'll himself uh, dwell on that. But, uh, you know, he has written another book. Snakes in the Ganga. Now that is a practically a sequel to this book because he has gone further into details how the challenges which he had mentioned here in this book, they have been further elaborated here. So I'm sure his talk is going to be very interesting and uh, because the format of the session we have kept that it will be an interactive one. So all of you can, are free to ask questions after uh, that. And of course, Vijayaji, is also the co-author of this new book and she'll also speak on part of the new book because the two are related in a big way. So, uh, back to you. Thank Mr. you very Boyle. much. I just want to inform Rajiv and Vijayaji, we have a galaxy of uh, senior officers here. We have Mr. Rajiv Mehrotra, actually he is Rakesh Mehrotra, Professor Rakesh Mehrotra, R.K. Misra ji, Arun Khanna ji, founder of Tima, Mr. B.K. Mitra, Mr. Manish, uh, VP of Jio, Dr. M.P. Singhal, our friend Bharti ji, this side Ravi Gandhi ji, Manari ji, Manari sahab, a lot of people are here. And uh, friends, now I have handed over to Rajiv ji and be ready to listen something which you have not heard so far, Rajiv ji. Well, th first of all, thank you very much for organizing this. Uh, what's uh, one of the special things about this is that I, I'm from the telecom industry myself. I uh, 
took early retirement when I was in my mid 40s uh, in the telecom and IT and uh, what now became the internet and in information technology industries. So I relate to this. I, uh, I wish 30 years ago when I was in that industry, I'd met many of you, mm -hmm. uh, but I was more US based. I was entirely US based and Europe and some Far East. <coughs> is, the, is the voice clear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here we are. Now, you know, artificial intelligence, the, a simple way to look at it is that if people suddenly become more intelligent, is that good or bad? So now it's not obvious that after all, if I become more intelligent, it's good for me. But if you raise the intelligence of everybody, then even my enemies become more intelligent. So you have to think uh, who is the one becoming more artificially intelligent and artificial boost. So if you give some shot and uh, the soldiers become five times stronger, the question is which side, you know, or cricket team, mm. which side? So. Yes, artificial intelligence boosts your intelligence, but the point is that also the other guy, other side who's opposing us. And so the question is who's doing it more? Are we controlling it? Are they controlling it? So this book has got five battlegrounds. And then I want to talk about the this new book, which, as he said, talk give, may, gives a substance to the first book. The first book creates a very big theoretical framework, some examples. And then this one is full of a lot of uh, examples of how our data is being compromised, how uh, foreign entities in the name of liberal arts or human rights or social justice, they're actually not only capturing our data, but also using the data to manipulate, profile and then create trouble in some cases. So the five battlegrounds in this first book were, first was about economy, industry, jobs. Will it be good? Will it be bad? Maybe some industries will boost but some industries will be out of business because and so when you say jobs will be lost and new jobs will be created, it won't necessarily be in the same city. So for instance, instance, in the United States, Silicon Valley will get a lot of jobs, but in the Midwest where they're using old technology, they lose the job. So you will have unrest, disruptions, regional, local disruptions. Maybe some young people will get a lot of new careers, but people in their midlife will lose their jobs because those jobs will be replaced. So this will be socially disruptive. The second is about geopolitics and military. And here I focus on USA, China, India triangle in this book, how the US China battle is going on in this AI. AI uh, and quantum computing are the cutting edge of what bothers the CIA the most about China. They can handle all kinds of stuff, but China has taken a, a lot of uh, lead, some of it stolen, some of it genuine but they have taken a lot of lead. The third ground is how the masses are being used by algorithms to manage their behavior. So are humans, are humans using the machines or are the machines also using us? It's a both ways. So the machines also managing what you buy, where you go on holiday, you know, well, how is your spending habit, what you, uh, which uh, uh, party you may vote for, what your ideology might be. So there, the machines are influencing that. If that were not the case, if you ask for proof, the biggest proof is the entire money of these, this trillion dollar industry, this social media tech industry is from advertising. Uh, it's free to you. Nobody has to pay for Google search or Facebook or all free. So the biggest free services in the world, the biggest free services in the world, unprecedented in history, are the richest people from those services. Now, this is something very strange. How come they give away all this stuff for free and then they become the richest people in the world? So obviously, they're making money somehow. And they're making money because they have mastered the ability to influence you, to understand you, build a psychological model of you. And then that is what is useful for advertisers. But what, if they can sell toothpaste and shoes and things like that, the same men, same process can also be used to manage your thinking. It can create trouble. It can also create violence and create riots. And they can figure out who are the likely people to be involved and how to manage, make them do something, change their behavior. So the idea of uh, uh, AI-based uh, mass mobilizations and mass trouble is huge. And we talk about it. I talk about Google Devta, Twitter Devta and Facebook Devta in this, 
in this book. And I'm also critical of some of the policies in India of inviting these people rather than making our own platforms the way China did, inviting them like, you know, with folded hands saying, please come and help us out. They're of course here in a big way. But if, as we go further and further, it becomes more and more difficult for us to ever become sovereign and independent ourselves. Now, the irony is that India has the largest army of AI engineers. If you look at the number of people, of India, Indian people here and foreign countries who are doing AI, it's like nobody else has so many people. And they're very smart people. They're at the top level. But they're not developing technology for India. They're de developing technology for whoever the client is. That could be Microsoft. It could be, you know, Apple. It could be Amazon or whoever it is. It could be Raphael. And then those jets, which are very expensive because they got AI and one pilot can do the job of 20 pilots because it's AI. So we license it back and we're very happy they're giving it to us. We, one of the most important things, the a avionics and the other AI stuff that we are getting uh, in those planes is AI based stuff. And a lot of the engineers and the technocrats who are involved are actually Indian. So, you know, Indian brains are not building technology owned, in, owned by India, whether it's whether, even if they're based in Bangalore working for some, you know, Microsoft India or whoever they're working for, Microsoft in Hyderabad, I guess. So whoever they're working for anywhere in India, the point is they're not building technology whose ownership is India. And you can say we have Sundar Pichai, he's a big shot, so it must be, we must be doing well. But he's an employee. He may be making a huge amount of money, but he's an employee. He's a, it's like, you know, you're working for, it's a Sarkari organization, you're working for a Sarkar, but is it this Sarkar or is somebody else's Sarkar? Or is it private sector? So this is an issue that we raise. The fourth one is, battleground is, the idea of self is being uh, eroded because more and more of my choices are being made by the algorithm. And I'm surrendering my will to make choice because it's convenient, I'm lazy. Also, uh, it seems like it knows me better than I know myself and, I, and it knows what's good for me. And so I keep surrendering my choice. It becomes habit until I start going on autopilot. Autopilot means that I don't even have to think. It just runs my life. And we call it moronization, means turning people into morons. Moronization is a term we coined to say moronization of the masses is a huge movement going on, which is a kind of erosion of selfhood. You atrophy your own faculties because you turn it over to the algorithm to run it for you. And then the fifth is I stress test India's Rashtra. I say stress testing the Indian Rashtra, which means you take our country and you stress test what, can, what, what could happen because of AI to India. How secure is it? How much of its big data has been given away? How much, what can, like you do some simulations. What can other people do to undermine India because they have this knowledge about us and they are deep inside with the tracking devices and so on. So that's what this uh, previous book uh, uh, is for. It's just uh, last year, uh, 2021. Now, Vijay and I have developed this snakes in the Ganga, which is a metaphor. Snakes is poisonous and uh, spreading poison. And Ganga is a metaphor for, you know, where you least expect danger. So you're living in comfort. You feel like everything is fine. Nothing, nobody around me, I'm taking a bath. Nobody around me is going to be a snake, you know. But we're, we're trying to say that in this safety of all our lives, there are some in our institutions, there are some dangerous individuals, ideologies and institutions that have in infiltrated. So this snakes in the Ganga, is about, there are a lot of things in it, but in the AI context, it tells you how many databases in India are actually controlled elsewhere. There is a Kumbh Mela project from Harvard where they went and they're mapping, it's called mapping the Kumbh Mela, very clear word. It says we want to build a map and a database to describe any every aspect, who comes, who doesn't come, who is biased, who is being oppressed. Uh, uh, is it masculine? Is it minorities being oppressed? Uh, uh, whatever it is. So this can feed the social justice programs, uh, human rights programs. So one day one can start filing cases and saying this Mela, like you can file case against some festivals, you can also start filing cases against the Mela because data exists 
and we don't have that data. So, as an example, uh, the partition project, all the stuff about partition being sucked into Harvard and they're giving money grants to anybody from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, wherever, who has some original archive, who have some data information, could be image, could be oral, could be physical, whatever it is. And so that, you know, in future, if you wanted to study the history of partition or you want to create, uh, you know, a discourse on partition, you'll have to go to Harvard, get permission because they'll have all this stuff. Right now, a lot of the colonial era information lies in England and some of it in places like Heidelberg in Germany, some of our ancient texts also in places like Harvard. So that a lot of the uh, people who have to do scholarship on that era have to go somewhere else. Uh, we, we don't, we haven't brought it back because this, uh, the original databases are still sitting there. Now, so this, there are, the, there are databases now being gathered on tribals, very sensitive databases. There are databases being drive, uh, on uh, the entire political system of India. Every election, there, there's, a, there's a database being developed by one of our universities. I think you, you should mention, describe it later. One of our universities in collaboration with foreign people to build a database of every election, central, state, so local level and a profile of the uh, historical profile of, ev of every politician who's ever stood for any election. So that you can build a whole picture of who wins, who loses, what are the trends, what are the patterns, you know, how do you, how do you predict, predictive model, how do you influence, how do you uh, infiltrate, who do you infiltrate. So all of this is being done. There are databases on uh, being developed on every lawsuit uh, going on, has gone on, so that they can interpret again who's in trouble, what are the patterns of trouble. So, you know, in other words, when we want to understand ourselves, we'll have to go to somebody for help. And, and they'll be, they are publishing all this and teaching our kids, they're teaching our IS people, they're teaching our industrialists, they're teaching our media people, our scholars. So, our gyan, our knowledge, our self-understanding of who we are is coming from them because they have the data, we don't. So, so the idea being, being that uh, the data, uh, and here we got examples from medicine, we have examples on public health, a lot of data on public health, a lot of genetic data. And some of it is going to places like Harvard, some of it is going to China. And we'll talk about that also here, we'll discuss that here. And then, you know, then there is an example here of, I've taken one example of a corporate, an American corporate group uh, called Omidyar. They have Omidyar network in India. So Omidyar network has invested $500 million in India in venture capital. It does not come as FCRA, it comes as FDI. So we are very happy. FDI to take you over. But FDI is, uh, is sort of without any questions asked, FDI. But this FDI is being used for little, little ventures, million dollar here, two million dollars. They've got about 200 ventures, venture capital, technology venture capitalists. And they've won over these th couple of thousand, two, three thousand young entrepreneurs in India, given them a boost and they own the technology. So first they're using Indian brains to own technology. Second, they're using Indian brains with, in collaboration with various Indian organizations, including government of India, to have access to data. So they are not saying Omidya access data, it is a venture. But who owns the venture is these guys. So these ventures own a lot of information. And now this, uh, the, some of and it's in local languages, they are understanding local customs, they know who's the leader here, uh, who, who is up, uh, who's against this group and which group is against which group. They know how to make you fight, they know how to make you laugh. They, they are really in pulling the strings you can, of emotional uh, be, uh, behavior outputs of people also. So this is a, this is a huge national security risk uh, that has not been identified as such. And I would say Omid, and Omidyar network we have shown here, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the problems was that they funded a foundation which was implicated in the overthrow of the previous Ukrainian government. So they are also involved in these kind of things. Uh, so the previous Ukrainian government was not uh, in favor of some country and they were more aligned with Russia or something. So these guys went in and so they kind of, the allegation is that they were aligned with the CIA and they do this type, type of job when they need to do. So you have these kind of people here and uh, th their open messages <coughs> that they are into social justice, social engineering of Indians, social engineering of Indians. What exactly does it mean? 
and why is somebody else sitting and trying to socially change the Indian behavior? Why? Why would they do that? Now, this person is very rich who started this, who owns it. He is 20 plus, 20 plus billion dollars net worth. Richer than George Soros, who is in his 80s. And Soros is known for doing all these things. But th this is half the age, four or five times the money. Far more technologically savvy and therefore far more dangerous. But our people are just tracking Soros, you know. But what is prani baat hai? Theek hai, wo bhi, wo bhi kar hai aise, but you prani baat hai. This is very fresh, new future thinking. So if you want to see the way, the rate at which this is developing, the rate at which they are, and they have every week they have campaigns. They give award to uh, you know the uh, the entrepreneur of entrepreneur who is fighting injustice in society. Uh, or in this particular region, uh, somebody who is empowering uh, certain dissident, dissenting groups. Uh, they, so, it is technology and entrepreneurship uh, for uh, empowering uh, the underclass in, in a good, if there are good things also, you should empower them. But empowering them, not only economically, but also political empowerment against the establishment. That is definitely a tone coming in there. So, you know, this means that you can, they can push it, this button, but they can also push that button. It depends on which way, how, what is their program, what is the, what, what do they want to achieve uh, in terms of India. And they say this, they are talking about the other half billion. Other half billion means the lower 500 million people of India. They are saying in the entire world, that is the opportunity for them to, uh, you know, bring in new technology, digitization of rural India, and social engineering, empowerment of India, all of that. So, a new community is being built, a whole new community with a different loyalty to somebody else. And the, 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 the interesting thing is that, you know, everybody is in love with them because they have money to give. They have money to give. So, uh, the MSMEs of India, which is the backbone of Indian economy, if you really think about it, are being replaced in some some place, ways by a new breed of MSMEs that they are creating. So, there is a, an ecosystem of old MSMEs and now with this new technology which is far more powerful, uh, they go in and they license it to this guy, that guy, that guy, create a new kind of MSME which is better educated, more technologically savvy and which is going to take market share, economic share from the other guys. So, when you say India is moving up, lot of the GDP growing, but lot of the other older GDP shrinking, it's also changing the social map of who is in power and who controls this power. So, uh, this is just one example, there is a whole chapter on that. So, uh, one thing uh, before I turn over to Vijaya, uh, one thing uh, finally I want to tell you is that the book is, looks very large. Um, but there is a way to read it in 3-4 hours and uh, you do not have to read fast, I will tell you how to read it. You read just the introduction which is an executive summary of the whole thing. In 30-40 pages, it is a summary of the whole thing and then every chapter has a one page overview, one, one and a half page overview. That gives you a kind of what are the, what is the takeaway from that chapter. So, you the 22 chapters. So, you can read the introduction and all, each of the overviews in a few hours and then you know everything we are trying to say. Then you can dive deeper wherever you want to, not have to read in sequence. It is designed in such a way. So, for example, chapter 4 will tell you the IITs are being attacked. IITs are being attacked as a system of racism and casteism and now they are putting quotas, they want to have, uh, they go into Silicon Valley and doing a caste survey to see what is the caste of all these Indian techies and India does not know how to respond, the, mini, the embassies do not know what has happened, uh, Indian IITs do not know what has happened, it has happened very suddenly but, but it has been brewing for a while. So, if you want to know, dig deeper into what is going on and what is our response, then you read one chapter. If you want to uh, look at what is China up to, taking advantage of all this, which I will talk about in detail, isolated chapters. If you want to read about what is happening to, you know, what is going on in Ashoka University or Kriya University or uh, Premji Foundation and, and others like that, who are really uh, kind of like a branch office or a footprint of these western uh, universities 
and you want to know more about specifics, what's going on, because we are quite open, we are naming names, we are giving quotations, we are, you know, uh, doing all that, then, you know, there are isolated chapters. So, you do not have to read cover to cover. You read the overview, uh, uh, introduction and overview, and then you pick which ones interest you and you read, dive into those. So, with that, I will turn over to Vidya to continue this conversation. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you. Namaste, uh, Vibhya. Is that? Can you hear me? Yes. yes okay. So I'll hold on to it. <clears throat> so Rajiv ji talked about Harvard. Yeah. Okay. Rajiv ji talked about Harvard having databases on the Kumbh, and we might not think it's a big deal. Um, but even if you look at other departments, for example, history at Harvard. There's a huge project looking at horizontal histories. So what do they mean by horizontal history is the history of the Bay of Bengal. So history need not be civilizational down chronologically, but history across geographies. And now where this is heading is coming up with the idea that national borders really don't matter because for tens of thousands of years, the Rohingyas have been, when there is a flood in Bangladesh, they've been taking a boat coming to this side. And then when the flood sort of recedes, they go back. And these sorts of archives and histories being built. So very soon, national borders would become a thing of the past. Similarly, even with the Indus, the water project uh, of the Indus and the, the Sindhu river, now, they look at and it's coming as part of history. So, these are things we need to keep an eye on because these are national security issues. Now, the bigger thing is that national security issues have moved from traditional domains to the domain of businesses and colleges. And this sounds sort of, you know, this illogical, but Governments essentially are becoming a thing of the past as these billionaires, they have technology, they have more money than most sovereign governments. In fact, Bloomberg said that Larry Fink of uh, BlackRock is the fourth branch of the US government because anytime there's a financial crisis, the legislators, the, the president calls Larry Fink of BlackRock because he controls more than 20 trillion in assets and he can do things that nobody, no sovereign government can do. Now, government functions are also being moved to corporates and that is why we need in the, the last uh, part four of the book, we'll talk about WEF, uh, the World Economic Forum and the elites and what their plans are. But very quickly, I, I also mentioned that uh, universities are a problem. Now, let's look at Ashoka University in uh, India. Now, in the liberal arts, uh, under the liberal arts umbre umbrella, you have first the Trivedi Center. For, it's actually called the Trivedi Center. It's not political science, Trivedi Center of political data. The job of the center, the sole function is to mine data. Rajiv ji mentioned that they are mining data and the if you go a little bit behind and see who's behind all of this it's a french connection so there is this professor jeff jaffer lot who is uh, christophe jaffer lot who is who also has um, taken part in the global hindutva conference he's viciously anti-hindu and hindu folk yeah uh, yeah global anti-hindutva conference and he is viciously anti-modi and anti-hindutva all of that but the French Ministry of External Affairs funds this. I mean, this should ring bells, right? Why is this not shut down, right? There are American universities like Berkeley also funding it. But the French Ministry of External Affairs funds the sciences po whatever, which then goes into Ashoka and mines. So they have educational qualifications, languages spoken, elections won at from panchayat level all the way till, you know, 
parliamentary elections. So they have data on all kinds of elections. How, you know, what is the basic education? How much uh, assets do they have? Uh, what languages they speak? What kind of jobs they've had in the past? Gov you know, judicial election, judicial uh, uh, nominations, uh, elections of any and all and sundry. Yeah. So this is the Ashoka's uh, Center for Political Data. Then we have Ashoka's Center for China Studies, which China is very smart. Uh, they are training Indians, uh, Indian scholars, Indian PhD scholars in, and Indian professors on China studies. So they want the right narrative to come through to India. So Ashoka is sort of the pipeline that brings in Harvard has a, a, a partnership with Harvard Yangcheng Inst Institute and ha Yangcheng of course is a Chinese institute. So they, they fund money, they pick up scholars and Ashoka then further sort of has a distribution pipeline to Christ College in Bangalore, uh, Somaya College in Maharashtra, Jadavpur University. So they are the sort of they bring young scholars, PhD scholars, postdoc scholars to their forum and then ship them to China for a year or two to learn China studies the Chinese way, the way the Ch you know, Chinese want Indians to think about China. China has already come into Bollywood and come into, for, you know, for, into popular media. They've also come into the, uh, the corporate world. But this is their way of, of teaching Indians to see China the right way. And, and by the droves, we are sending our scholars to Ashoka and through Ashoka into China. So then we have um, the Center for Social Impact and Philanthropy. So this is another, uh, so wherever the billionaires are, this becomes a national security issues and uh, billionaires are now looking into how can, so they are teaching our Indian donors to move from services kind of philanthropy where you provide healthcare, education, annadanam, things like that, that we traditionally do, due to activism and so advocacy and rights. So they're saying since the government clamped down on the FCRA licenses, we need to teach Indians to do advocacy and rights because of the FCRA issue. And how do we make them do? How do they make them do? They of course have the Ashoka Center for Social Behavior and Change. So doing using AI and they work with the Niti Aayog, this social behavior and change. So in fact, they, during COVID, they did a study as to, you know, why are these Indians so into karma and saying whatever happens, happens, we have to change their behavior. So as much as vaccination might, might have been a good thing, it's not one size fits all. And people were forced, vaccinations were forced on because there are big, bigger powers guiding our higher ups. So, uh, and one of the, um, the um, people who were involved was Ashoka's behavioral science uh, people. Now, in this Center for Social Behavior Change, you have people like Gates. So, Gates does a project with Kriya University down, down south. And Kriya is, is another cesspool of, of data mining for, you know, I'll just kind of I quickly jot it down what Kriya is doing in terms of get data mining. Agriculture, productivity, farm size, farm size and what they're producing, Kriya is mining data on. Pollution of plants in Gujarat, like factories in Gujarat. 14,000 households, 300 villages, financial inclusion project, they have data on. 2.5 million people's uh, personal data and financial behavior, you know, their buying patterns, their labor force participation patterns, everything out of 111 villages and four districts in Tamil Nadu, right? And then Odisha, uh, early childhood intervention in 192 villages. And Kriya, Kriya collects this, sends it to Yale University. And now tomorrow you, you want access to this data, you, you don't own the data. Right? They have the entire mapped out everything from, uh, you know, from uh, Tamil Nadu and other places on various topics. Now, Kriya, so Bill Gates is very concerned why Indian women are not participating in the labor force. So, on one side, he's saying it's upper caste issue because of patriarchy, like most of the men like you, not letting your wives go out to work. So, that's kind of the... Uh, 
the assumption. Then he goes to Ashoka University to the behavioral science uh, center and says, how can we change that? How can we make women participate? So Gates is very concerned about women in India. And you just have to laugh at that because uh, uh, so the um, essentially what they're trying to do is, um, you know, with people like um, um, Omidyar, they're trying to get a, somebody said a God's eye view of the world uh, with big data and and see how people can be controlled. Now, what is very interesting is that we need to keep a check on for national security reasons is the think tanks. So Brookings Institute is totally compromised by the Chinese. So when you have a Brookings fellow come in and it's a well known fact uh, in America, the CIA guy was part of Brookings and some apparatchiks were under him. So it's, it's a very well known fact in, in American you know, top security circles. Now, and we've also given some references. So, Brookings Institute is compromised, Carnegie Endowment, uh, you, uh, World Endowment is compromised. So, all these are compromised and all these people send fellows who are on the board of Ashoka Institute's, uh, Ashoka University's China Studies program um, and all over the place. They're, they're sort of fellows, they, they study India. and So, we need to look at who these think, think tanks are sending into the country to sit on a board because they're just not sitting on a board doing nothing. Yeah. The second thing we need to look at is Indian diplomats and bureaucrats like yourselves. After you retire, what are you doing? For example, the Trivedi Center has Mr. Qureshi, who was an ex election commissioner sitting on the board. I'm not assigning any motives, but I'm just saying dal mein kuch kala hai. That's all. Okay. So, as, as a lay person, right, it doesn't take much to add up. So, we need to look at what are these diplomats doing? They, they, they become uh, fellows at the Kennedy Center uh, at Harvard. Into, so, the our Indian diplomat, who, I mean, who was the uh, diplomat representing India in China, now post retirement becomes a Harvard Kennedy School fellow in the China India, you know, uh, discourse. And one has to wonder that what is with us, right? So, this is something we need to also look at and maybe come up with clauses as we hire diplomats, have a contract with them saying this is a, even post retirement, there should be some kind of a, you know, full disclosure, non-compete, some kind of, I don't know, legal thing that we hold them responsible post retirement. Now, the last thing is, of course, corporates, NGOs are a thing of the past, FCRA is a thing of the past, even governments are a thing of the past, right? The power lies elsewhere with AI and corporate houses. So we need to look at the, the FDI, where even in the West, this is happening. People are like uh, Facebook's, um, they have Chan, Zuckerberg, LLC. It's an LLC. They stopped doing, it's very old fashioned to be giving money for tax for a measly 20% tax break uh, to start a non-profit. So it's better to sort of do a for-profit, you have no scrutiny and you can go about your business and data pays for itself. You know, the data that you mine pays for itself. So corporate structures and of course the last thing is ESG, environment, social justice and governance in, in companies. They're bringing this in. It's, way, it's a way of so, a social credit system. Like, um, like China has a social credit system at an individual level. Corporates are also being made and this is a Western, you know, this is a BlackRock imposed uh, um, ESG rubric and it has all the ideas of wokeism as far as what is social justice, one should always ask because what is social justice to you may not be social justice to me. So on what, what is the basis for such social justice and does it go gel well with our Indian context, right? We can't just accept something.
just because of it. And the last thing, of course, um, uh, Ashoka has the center of uh, gender studies and sexuality and, you know, Shigoyal asked me to say a few things. Uh, the things they are trying to get into the national education policy, they, um, they want, uh, so the ex so-called experts outside Ashoka and inside Ashoka that they bring in, uh, they want to decouple gender from sex, um, calling gender fluid and most biology biologists don't accept that. Number two, they want to sexual, sex, sexualize children very early because family is considered patriarchy and they want to break up the family. Uh, if you think this that I'm just making up all this, I'm really not. We have enough evidence in the book. They want to bring pornography into children's lives because they, they think pornography will teach children a lot about pushing boundaries and risk taking because life is all about exploring desires. Uh, they want to uh, destigmatize pedophilia. I'm not making this up. They calling pedophiles minor attracted persons uh, so that it destigmatizes. They also believe that sometimes children have attraction towards adults and they should be allowed to express their attraction to an adult and have a sexual relationship and parents should not come in the way. So these are all things that are coming slowly. Yeah. This is at the scholarship level, but it's all there and they discuss these things. They want the idea of childhood innocence is very white or Brahmanical in our case in, in the Indian context. And so this idea of childhood innocence is, is, should be broken, should be destroyed. No child is supposed to have innocence because that's a thing of born of patriarchy. So these are things that are coming into the um, education program and I'm not making this up as ridiculous as all these sounds th these sound I'm not mm. making it up so they are coming so the whole liberal arts curriculum they're training people to sort of spread these ideas all over so if, if we can do nothing else I think we can try and save our young youngsters from this you don't have to do anything else just stop liberal arts uh, or discourage people from sending their children because you're paying 40 lakhs for your children to become this who to lose total identity. We haven't installed, instilled any identity in them, but at least we don't have to have others do the job for us because your children will not be anything connected to you. So we have to look at it as what can we do immediately to plug the holes and then what can we do from a national security standpoint, from a long-term strategic standpoint to save the nation. Namaste. Can I say a few words? I just want to add a few things to that, to just to continue. So, uh, I, I'll, I'll make four or five points. Our assessment of the awareness in India among the powers to be who ought to be aware is that they are aware in data points, like blind men looking at an elephant, looking, some guy thinks it's this, he doesn't know the rest of the elephant, and some guy knows that, but he doesn't know anything else. So, the awareness of these things uh, people haven't connected the dots. You will find brilliant people who know a little bit here and a little bit there. But it seems like there's a lack of uh, overall strategy and there seems to be nobody who owns this problem. I don't know who owns it. I talked to the head of ICCR, Sahasra Buddheji. We've talked to, uh, you know, people in the home ministry. Uh, we've talked to people, a lot of people in the uh, HRD, in the culture ministry and whatever. We've talked to people in technology. We've talked to people in academia. It seemed like everybody's in a little kind of a frog in a well, isolated kind of view. Uh, whereas it's the foreign guys who put a whole overall map of India, putting it together, coming up with how you manage India, how you deal with India, who's who. And all this being done with big data and AI is very powerful. Whereas I don't think it, it, it's people in India are putting this kind of a view together. And that's concerning. Second is that a lot of uh, response, a lot of uh, response I get in India is that we have all these policies, big uh, policies on locating the database in India. But locating the database in India is not going to solve the problem. Where it is physically located has nothing to do with who has access to it. Uh, you know, you Facebook can put all their servers here. Doesn't matter. The point is that the Facebook server, you don't have access to it. Facebook has access to it, so it doesn't matter where it's located. Even if you access, I mean, anybody who's from software knows this, and telecom, you guys. Even if you access it physically, you do not know how to make sense of it mm -hmm. because it's coded. I mean, it's uh, uh, one, once uh, I was saying this and a very senior financial guy, a very top guy, one of the big brains, uh, he's a CA by 
profession. He said, no, 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 we have this uh, database, uh, you know, located. So I said, if you have a company's chart of accounts, financial, and you have all the numbers available to you, but you don't know what the headings are. You know, if it says so many thousand crore, but you don't know, is it re turnover, is it revenue, is it sales, is it this year, is it last year? You don't know what, what it means. It's just a number. It means nothing to you. So similarly, if you just access the AI uh, databases, all these huge tables that AI consists of, all the big data is put in massive, uh, you know, terabytes and all that of data. Uh, you can access it, but it's just a bunch of zeros and ones. It doesn't mean anything to you. So this this feeling of security that we have required that the servers should be in India is so stupid because you don't for, you don't even have access. Even if you got the access, you don't know how it what it means. What you would want is that they have to give a full transparency of source code, which they will never do. And you have to uh, have full disclosure of what the algorithm says, which they will never give you. So, unless you tell me the algorithm and unless you give me the source code, in which case it will take a large number of technical engineers to figure it out and this is changing in real time. So, un so all those are obstacles. So, you cannot really say it's just to it's just to make people happy that secure the false sense of security that we are going to have servers located in India. I mean, if I have a lot of information on you and I know how to map you, manipulate you, where are your, where are your vulnerabilities, it doesn't matter if that database is sitting in your bedroom. It doesn't matter. I have access to it and that's what matters. So that's the second point. The third point is, Vijay said a lot about China in the US. Now, only a few years ago has the US become very vigilant about China. So, it is true that there are pushbacks. The, the FBI has arrested some Harvard professors and there are all these new things happening and, and you know, gradually they are putting restrictions. But China has been getting into the US deep and deep and deep for 25 years, very systematically. And it is so deep and there are so many Americans who are into this sold out and so many compromised people, it will take a long time to get rid of all that. And meanwhile, what China is doing is taking some of these uh, these entry, these cells, sleeper cells and or whatever kind of things in the United States and using them to get into other countries because India doesn't suspect that somebody coming from Harvard or something like that they are, you know, must be okay. So, sometimes China is going via a third country. It doesn't have to be only US, Singapore, UAE. A lot of the investments in India that are classified as Singapore are actually a company of China based in Singapore. You know that. There are there are a lot of these investments. So, India can fool itself, tell the public that a Chinese investments won't be allowed and the media is not uh, uh, exposing the issue. They are saying that these uh, Chinese investments won't be allowed. But there are Singaporean companies, Dubai companies, are companies in various places that are entirely Chinese owned and from there they are investing and so it is classified as a Singaporean investment. And finally, I would like to say that her point on uh, retired bureaucrats. I own 20 companies in different countries in one, at one, one point in time, about 30 years ago before I quit all that. And so, when my companies uh, got into some local issue, some problem, you know, uh, whatever, uh, I went to the US Embassy uh, as an American company for help and they gave me all kinds of help, uh, advice. Um, and then they, I would be referred to some consultant. So, I'd go to a consultant. And so, this consultant would tell me that, listen, in Poland, you should hire a retired KGB person. He will fix all your problems. He will know his way around. He will know who's who. He will know who's sleeping with whom. He'll know he'll have his own people. And whether it is to be done through legal means or through whatever means or to influence somebody, that's what you need to do. I had never thought of it that way. And there's an American CIA guy telling me this that, you know, the first thing you should do, you're a fool. Your first thing an American businessman do when you're going somewhere, you hire some of these national security retired people and all these kind of guys who know their way around. So, that is what she means by saying that a lot of Indian retired people potentially are, are compromised. I mean, we are not naming names or accusing anybody, but we are just telling you this. So, those are just some of my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know whenever they talk, we have lots of things to say. 
I intentionally kept one hour and fifteen minutes for discussions across. But before that, I would like our chairman to say something in brief, and then my request to all of you, one by one, be as brief as possible. Do us. Thank you, Golsam, Honorable Rajiv Narutra Ji, Madam Vijay Vishnath, my colleague Vimal. I think it's too much if I speak about artificial intelligence in front of experts. I think it's too much for me. Only thing I think I don't know whether uh, <coughs> you briefed him about IT APT a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. We yes. last time uh, then we had that webinar. Mm -hmm. we yes. Had, uh, but let me just uh, reiterate uh, very quickly the association which uh, came into being about 15 years back. We is an association which uh, had we collected. I was one of the founder member in that. Goel is also one of the founder member. We had think tank which we had requested people who have been the expert without any remuneration. To tell you very frankly, you said na bureaucrats without any, and they are still there. This institution, I'm calling this not association. I'm calling it an institution. We have developed this institution over a period of time now. It's almost close to 15 years plus. Ours is not a lobbying institution. We're not an advocacy. Ours is some synergy between what you said and what we keep on doing is more about the awareness program. What is happening on the spectrum side? What is happening on the infrastructure side? All that, you know, we have collected a think tank who keep on helping us and we made various groups who keep on helping us so that we go and represent the interest of the industry at large in ITOPT. We have now a very recognizable name in the ITOPT. We participate in all sorts of consultation papers, all groups that we have, all the study groups that we have. And we have also, some of us are the chairman of various study groups into that. That is where I think this uh, institution has come up. And we are glad that we have you here today. I won't be talking about artificial intelligence because it's beyond me. There are a few things which I just thought, I don't think, uh, I, I don't think uh, Professor Rajiv Merotra and I, there are going to be any job depletion into this. What is required probably, my thinking, is maybe... The existing manpower, you might need upskilling, reskilling, you might do that. And a lot of the things on AI are written by people like McKinsey, Deloitte and Touche. Uh, these kind of, obviously those guys are huge international consulting companies whose clients are the multinational of the world. So they're representing all the multinationals, their multinational interests, their clients are not. Deloitte and Touche and McKinsey don't make money from uh, local MSMEs. They don't. So if there is a concentration of power and wealth, uh, the pyramid getting more, fewer people getting more and more money, uh, you know, the Deloitte and Touche and McKinsey are not going to make noise and raise hell about it because that's not their client. The client is not at the bottom of the pyramid. And a very common methodology saying uh, to find out what percent of the jobs will be added and what percent of this. If you look in the footnotes in the end, uh, they did HR surveys of top 100 companies. So obviously the top 100 companies, their HR department will talk about what's in it for them. They, they did not do a survey of the panchayat, of the small town, small village. I have said in response that they should have, for every state in India, it should not be done at the center, every state in India should do an AI impact for that state. So, in your state, in, in Tamil Nadu, you have 5 million or whatever number of jobs for auto sector. Now, when the technology changes in the new electric vehicles and so on and driverless cars and so on, you may not have a carburetor, you may not have a spark plug, you may not have those things. Obviously, the small little guys who are making those things will out of business. And maybe some new guy making lithium battery will come, but that lithium battery imported with lithium imported from China will be look, not necessarily the same guy who lost his business. So, you know, when you, when, uh, when uh, somebody, when a new big company comes and takes over and disrupts a ecosystem, 
maybe the net jobs will be the same, but it will be different people. And the different people will be coming from a different strata, a different e economic class, loyal to somebody else, licensing the know-how of somebody else, which allows them to do all this. So, that, so it's really not that straightforward. If you really want an honest assessment, you have to have every state have an AI commission and, and every state should uh, hire, should get people who are local at the district level and figure out what's going to be the AI impact. You cannot sitting in Delhi with big consultants that the TIO brings in uh, uh, that represent the, the, the multinational play point of view, the top heavy point of view. You cannot get an accurate picture of AI impact, in my opinion. Thank you. <coughs> I mean, because what I said was, Nitiyo volume one, Nitiyo volume, we have just read it through. You gone more into deeper into them. And you know, the guys who made, they were all paid guys. Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised that uh, Niti Ayog refers to uh, some, uh, you know, PricewaterhouseCooper <laughs> report <laughs> out of London. Mm -hmm. So, I go to the PricewaterhouseCooper report person and it's an Indian sitting in the London office, but he doesn't want to talk to me. And he, he's basically scared he, because he's, this is their corporate responsibility. So, there's also lack of transparency. concept <laughs> Price water amount of credibility. I have a more example. That's very true. You're very true. They, they get credibility by putting the tapa mm -hmm. of this big foreign institution. I have a white paper, 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 Price Waterhouse ka, yeah. McKenzie ka. Right. Oh. Then it is big. And so it that is, is, that and is it will be launched by some high. Field. That is exactly what we are criticizing. The Harvard phenomenon exactly. is exactly that. Yeah. They will choose that we the Kennedy School of Government will invite this guy to be, to legitimize him because he talks our language. We will not invite that guy because he doesn't talk our language. We will ignore him. And so by doing this, we are building our own support base in India by bringing certain people with certain ideologies all the time, boosting them. So, when he writes his paper, it will come with the Harvard Tappa. And so, he will, everybody will believe. So, this is the use of credibility and brand value to colonize people who are in inferiority complex. That's really what it amounts to. Uh, this challenge is not only with Niti Aayog. I mean, for the past few years, uh, in every department of the government, we have these uh, big force. And this is the challenge. I mean, we have uh, become mental slaves, back to back to mental slavery yes. of the West. So this is one challenge. And second thing which I didn't talk about when I spoke uh, was, because I thought maybe it will be covered, that uh, one of the reasons that we are holding this conference today, this, this meeting today, is that uh, the funding by the Indian industrialists. And it also includes funds by people in the telecom industry to the tune of almost 50 million and all that uh, dollar, US dollars. So this is a matter of concern. In our industry itself, there are people. This is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I agree with you a billion times. And I only introduced uh, to uh, Bagluji that Rajiv ji ka ye dekh ka. then we started talking about that. So, I've been listening to you and talking for a long time. Well, coming back to the situation, practical situation. We, each individual Indian is not honest. That's first thing. Second thing, keeping the servers you are talking about. As per the Patriot Law of uh, US, any server of any U.S. company placed anywhere in the world has to be transferred to Department of Commerce or Department of Defense. The U.S. Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. U.S. Department of Defense. Yes. So you, you keep your servers in India, what the hell is going to do? Right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So exactly. we are trapped in a such a way. And when I go and talk to them, I say, isko aisa kar lo. no, 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 I think you are too much. Uh, <laughs> 
हमने तो ये लॉ बना दिया हमने ये लॉ बना दिया हमने ये कर दिया हमारी ये कमीशन वो कमीशन वट दिल्थ इज कमीशन आर डूइंग अराउंड in the interest of india i don't know what they are doing that is they are, they are supposed to do this thing they are supposed they are being paid for doing surveillance on these kind of activities and uh, we we don't see any report or anything even a media report that we have anything being done by these people around the world no no that's very good point because i have always felt for 30 years i'm doing this and i always felt felt I don't find the Indian embassy doing um, aware of all this. They think, "Hey, wow, you are doing this. Hey, wow, 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 great!" But they, it's their job. Uh, it's the job of uh, Indian intelligence people, is HRD people, Ministry of External Affairs people, a lot of these kind of people. So, uh, what we can do, what Vijay and I can do, is put out books and let the whole world know. And we are open. We are naming names. We are naming names in this. We are putting a lot of people name in this book. Uh, and so we li- rely on. people like you to study this read this talk about it and we are willing to come i'm coming we are coming again in february by the way and we can do more talks can, can i say something sure please um interesting that you bring this up in 2012 ronanson was the diplomat to the us and amritya uh, sen got the um, nobel. nobel prize so he took 5 million dollars in 2000 whatever 11 or whatever that money and begged harvard to take 5 million dollars the local thinkers in america said harvard should not take this money from a poor country because india was much poorer then mm-hmm. and 5 million dollars was a lot of money and he was begging harvard please please take it because we are so proud of amitya sen's work now finally harvard took the money and when they got many criticisms from many americans although in india it just went by now there's something called the mormon files you know the mormon uh, church is a is sort of a cultish church but very powerful in the us and many people come out of the mormon church and they produce something like the mormon files as the in, inner workings of the church and how they do what they do so in one of those videos it came out that a senator from utah wanted visas for missionaries mormon send out very aggressively proselytize and they send uh, you know missionaries overseas so um they had a problem with the visas for so many missionaries to india and um, the senator was saying don't worry this great chap ronan you know he said he's our man he's our man if you can't go to the front door he said he'll work out the visas through the back door so this is our diplomat in office giving 5 million dollars to harvard begging them and working with missionaries of the mormon church G- through the back door gave a 100 visas right and breaking the law i'm assuming and then comes back retires and gets the padma bhushan <laughs> the big people we know steve job bill gates and the pachai do not allow the children to use internet or mobile why the hell they are forcing us to do right and this is thanks to the covid covid thanks i am saying in a sarcastic way because covid forced us to give phone to the children for education Correct. so my request to parents have all been chhod do phone na aap tv dekhna band hi kar do na kyu tv dekh rahe ho kyu phone dekh rahe ho and why are you on the social media ek saal to ye iska jawab hai aapki baat ka sirf yeah Correct. anybody else yeah yes sir uh i had a suggestion the way you have classification for say vegetarian and non vegetarian food by putting a red dot or a green dot or the way you have your electrical gadgets one star two star three star we should probably have technology wise uh, products which compromise our national security i'll give you a couple of examples in delhi there probably more than 100000 cameras of hikvision which is a chinese company 
all the servants are in china so imagine sitting in china they can see every house entrance gate they can see so many data points they are getting data 24 7 similarly the largest drone company and i'm glad indian government has taken some action on that is a chinese company dji so all the guys flying drones you have to download the app when you're flying a drone it maps your area and all that data is going to china so these are points where and i mean of course facebook microsoft i mean these kind of things youtube and all everybody knows but i'm saying these are very specific data points imagine <laughs> In India, if there are a million Hikvision cameras, China has access to one million cameras in the country. They could be on the roads, they could be in houses, they could be everywhere. And a common man who's like, a, you know, your cable TV guy who will say, Saab, I'll put 5,000 rupees, camera laga dunga, ye kar dunga. cheaper the better. So people are getting these installed today and nobody even knows the risk behind it. So even an awareness campaign would be wonderful and classification that, you know, this should be like you have pesticides, you know, from red label to white to green to yellow, you know how toxic it is. So you can use a pesticide depending on how much exposure you want. So almost as toxic as that are these kind of technologies. So, you know, I'm surprised actually, at least very totally agree with you. I'm actually surprised that while there's so much discussion going on data privacy, the source of this data, the camera, has never been the top topic of. The Indian government should actually say that uh, <coughs> camera is a controlled item. And we will regulate who does the camera, what kind of camera, we have to file with us, we will certify that it is safe for society and all that kind of stuff. So, but I think the market forces are too big to, for the government to have the strength to do it. Now, I, I have uh, in my AI book, I have given an example of uh, uh, Zimbabwe where China has a program to monitor security using okay. their cameras. And one of the things they're doing is keeping an eye, using facial recognition, keeping an eye on people that the government considers to be troublemakers. So the government decides these are the troublemakers, whoever they might be. So you put the government on your side. It's like East India Company would keep the Raja on their side. And we look out for your enemies, but then you are our man. Now, if you step out of line, then we also get you. you. Okay. So, this means that the Zimbabwe government is actually a captive of the Chinese. They are staying alive and staying afloat because the Chinese are keeping them afloat using this so-called surveillance and security and all that, which, which actually means espionage. And the same thing now being done in Pakistan, not so openly, with the with huge amount on their highways and all that, surveillance by Chinese, giving it to ISI so that ISI can keep itself in power because Chinese are their informant who keep their, all of this going. But of course, it means that they also keep ISI in line. So this is such an obvious thing. It has been out there for a long time, but government has not done, not even bothered to do anything about it. I've been involved in this particular, the first draft of the, the privacy. Believe me, sir, not a single fellow, not a single fellow was there who was talking what is in Indian interest. What the government can do. Okay. Uh, I want to, just a minute, yes. I want to inform my respected member. Our association is but nam for this purpose. Because we have been taking up the cases against Chinese cameras in railways, defense, even in the office of governor of Jammu Kashmir, even in the police of Jammu Kashmir. And we have successively proved that Chinese cameras are not cheaper. What they do, they will give you camera for one rupee and software for hundred rupees. So, uh, thanks to the Minister Piyush Goyal at that time, Railway Minister, we have proven to the world that Chinese cameras are costly as compared to cameras from Japan or Korea or other countries. We are known for this purpose. We are doing it in a big way. But as per the government, we can't intervene in the private lives. Only government department. That was the thing I took. Yeah, you were saying something, anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Goyal, sir. I am MP Singhal. Uh, thanks, uh, Rajivji, Vijayji, for bringing a very good research and study on this uh, very vital topic. Yes, I am uh, was uh, definitely associated with some of the government organization and uh, with Niti Aayog also on this AI topic. In fact, uh, in this digital age, which I am feeling, this is my view, that uh, the to spread i were talking about the 
cameras or maybe any digital devices, the backbone behind that is the chipset, which is at present is not been manufactured in India. So whatsoever we can control, we can say yes, Chinese camera, we cannot use it. Maybe some other equipment, we cannot use it. But the chips, which is being made either from uh, Singapore, maybe from uh, China. So uh, ultimately, that is the where the everything is being hooked up. Everything is software wise or hardware wise is being built and where they can be transported, where the data can be transported. As on now also, I'm associated with the cloud computing very widely. And I'm seeing the complete telecom network which is being now installed, it is on complete cloud computing, which is again, it may be hosted in India, but the technology wise and the data transportation, it is worldwide, it is available. Thank you. Uh, this is Mr. Singhal has been the head of department called Telecom Engineering Center as an advisor and he was responsible for making standards. Mm -hmm. So what he says makes a lot of sense. Very good. Sir, my name is Gaurav Kumar and sir, I have two brief questions. The first question is uh, like uh, these Indian private universities which are uh, working as the uh, uh, agents for the foreign elite Ivy League institution for these data set projects. So uh, the root cause is there, there is no accountability like the FCRA for the NGOs for these uh, universities and they are doing this free data traffic kind of thing uh, to send all these sensitive data which can later be used to compromise Indian national security. So uh, are, are there any way outs that there can be some filters or checks by the Indian uh, institutions on these private universities? Are there already any examples in the world today uh, like what is happening in India? Is this the same thing being ha happening in Japan by China or in other countries by other nations? So can can you cast some examples what they are doing to protect their integrity? And my second brief question is about as the AI uh, algorithms become more complex and uh, since their ownership is by foreign MNCs. So how can we protect ourselves from modernization and uh, how can we keep a check on our uh, uh, ourselves so that we uh, our con uh, con uh, consciousness uh, don't get compromised? Thank you. To answer the second question first is essentially what Sri Goel talked about. You have to have a generation that's rooted well. Uh, I raised two boys at home with no TV, no, my older one, he's 22 now, he's had a phone for three years now, uh, only now, because I had to send him to college. So uh, I think what he says is, is a very simple thing, but very hard to do, but very effective in terms of cutting off social media. I'm, I'm not on social media. People ask me, oh, how come uh, you're not there? I mean, in fact, even the, the Padega, person said you should be on social media and I said no because I have to be a good role model to my children I can't be on social media because that's prime important that's of prime importance to me whether I write one book or ten books that's not the point but I think we have to stick to certain rules like that right because if I am not on social media I then I have I can tell my children not to be on social media otherwise you it's not what you say it's what you do so it's very important that Households cut yourselves out of. We've never had a TV. I've, since I've had children, I've never had a TV, whether in the United States or in India. I've never had a TV. Yeah. So this is this is very important when you're raising children, especially in the modern times. It's very important. Okay. Number two, and I, I what are other countries doing? See, Ashoka and Kriya and all are not doing anything illegal. Let's be very clear about it. They're not doing anything illegal. It's above board. It's in. They're doing research, and they're doing research for for foreign. In, they have MOUs with foreign universities, and in the spirit of academic freedom, they're doing it. Now, within academic freedom, you have to also think about these things. And I'll give an example. Singapore uh, had a partnership with Yale University. They signed an MOU in 2014, and. It, they, you have may have heard of the Yale NUS program and they had a course called um, studying resistance uh, uh, resistance and dissent in Singaporean society 
and the education minister said we don't need to teach our students about dissent and resistance because we are a very harmonious society we have we have multiple races in our society different languages we've lived in harmony and singapore cannot afford this kind of a course incitement right where where people are taught to be activists because the singapore eco economy depends on singapore being a harmonious society so they cut the whole partnership with yale university they said we don't need liberal arts in our university so there are people who essentially are doing that. The other bad example is, like Rajiv Ji said, Harvard University, which has essentially compromised itself for money from the Chinese. The Yugo camps, uh, detention camps, the people who have expanded those camps, are uh, Harvard trained, Kennedy School trained CCP agents. So Harvard works in lockstep with the CCP to do their dirty job. They in fact have a project for social credit system, you know, to monitor people for the Chinese. So they work in lockstep. Microsoft also works in lockstep with the with the Chinese. They, they remove certain words uh, that do not, uh, or, or translations in, in Microsoft Word and some of their products. So all these guys actually are compromised. American universities are compromised. Companies are also compromised. So, um, so you can do, you can take a bold step like Singapore, uh, Russia doesn't want all of this, they, they take a very, very hard stand. So in the book we talk a little bit, we have a lot more in, that we haven't put in the book, but uh, you can take a stand. Uh, but these guys are not doing anything illegal, it's up to the government to put some of these controls. Thank you very much. And you have raised a good point, as of now we don't have any such policy, but the purpose of awareness we are doing is that only. I want to tell something very interesting to my telecom fraternity. 5G, 5G we are talking for last 5-6 years. And the example given by Rajiv and Madam, how does it go into our country systems? We formed a high level group on 5G. We made chairman, a person called Professor Paul Raj from US. He made certain recommendations and he suddenly gave a press interview that Huawei and Jetty are not a security risk to Indian national security. I was activated by somebody from security agencies and I conducted a research because China thinks I am Chinese man because I have seven office there. And I decoded that Professor Paul Raj University in the US has got funding from China for this five level, 5G high level group program. And uh, after submission of the report, Singhal Sahib, within one month he got an award from China called China Friends Day Award, hmm. by virtue of which he is allowed to have free entry, free travel, free hospital, free stay, etc. etc. in China. Credit to myself, I met Paul Raj in one of the programs after one month or so of that report. And he says, I know you, Goel, but my problem is whatever you have said is so authentic that I cannot challenge you. Mm. So that was the way I was telling you is that that is how the reports are made. Paul Raj is an Indian person and known very good technology wise, he is the founder of Memo. And Mr. Mani is from Jio. You want to say something? You know, as far as raising awareness is concerned, definitely I will do it. Uh, I'm on various uh, WhatsApp groups, so at least I keep on writing, uh, mentioning my number, uh, uh, you know, uh, risking my life at times. Uh, but definitely I'll make uh, a small write-up and spread kind of every week, which which I can do in a small and, you know, simple bite, uh, which you said and in that way. Can I say, uh, this is very nice, but in your personal capacity. So, how about in your professional capacity, because you are very in a very senior position in Reliance, in your geo. Uh, how about bringing about a dialogue, a conversation? Actually, the head of uh, AI in geo was, interview, was uh, interviewed me in the AI book. One of the YouTube channels is, uh, I've forgotten his name. Okay. But he, he, was, uh, he had a very big discussion with me. It's on my YouTube channel. <clears throat> and I gave him all the problems and he agreed. 
actually openly on camera he agreed he said i really agree with you we have to take note of this and that is when they had just uh, taken some big investment from microsoft from uh, facebook and google and i complained about it i said that you know you firstly uh, compromise the national security and secondly a big company like you is the only way we can build our own platform and he agreed with me so uh, so i think uh, and and uh, and maybe i should get back in touch with him but i think that the big corporates have a role to play and those who are in senior positions in those corporates can raise the issue and say can we see in the united states i'll tell you what google is doing they're facing so much public pressure that they have a lot of this uh, ai and ethics and a and social responsibility and so folks like me can, are can go and talk to them and they organize a conference at least they're listening and they're listening because they feel that they better listen because it's better to know what the public is thinking rather than pretend we don't know it in their own good and so i would say that rather than india waiting for something big happening in the us and then reacting to that i think the indian corporates should take the lead and create open listening forums and we would love to be part of that if you can organize such a thing we would love to whether it's a private meeting we'll go talk next time you're here in february or if you want to make it into public evening a meeting we can do that but people like relias we have a lot to say lot to say that we have not published and we would like an opportunity thank you i find mr ark mr ji aap kuch kehna cha rahe hain bahut der se main feel kar raha hu itni der se baith ke ki ye topic jo aaj hum log discuss kar rahe hain isme consciousness ethics ye do cheez hamare life style mein nahi imbibe kiya gaya कहीं से ये डीपली नहीं किया गया बीच में हम लॉस में हमारे लिए ये एक डिस्कनेक्ट हो गया था और इसको अब समय आ गया है कि फिर से इसको इनकॉर्पोरेट किया जाए हमारे यहाँ इंस्टीट्यूशंस में कहीं से कोई कुछ हम नहीं कहीं कोई फीलिंग एथिकल वैल्यू के ऊपर में कुछ दी नहीं जा रही है सो ये एक डिस्कनेक्ट हो गया है जो कि इस स्टेज पे आके जब फैग एंड ऑफ अवर लाइफ हम इसको फिर से रिजुवनेट करने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं या फिर से इसके बारे में सोचने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं ये किताब कुछ दिन पहले यूट्यूब में आई थी इसके ऊपर में लिखा गया था और उसको हम लोगों ने थोड़ा सा समझने की कोशिश की थी टॉपिक ही इतना चैलेंज मतलब सुन के ही इतनी मतलब एक तरीके से हिंदी में इसलिए बोल रहे हैं कि अच्छा लगता है हिंदी में बोलना और इस टॉपिक के ऊपर में आपने किताब भी लिखी है मैं बैठ के और सभी चैप्टर्स को देख रहा था जल्दी जल्दी और देखा इसमें डायरेक्टली हिट किया गया है चीजों के ऊपर में हमें बदलना होगा अगर देश को अगर हमें बदलना है तो हम सबको बदलना होगा और कम से कम अपने पर्सनल लाइफ में और अपने इन्वायरमेंट में इन चीजों के बारे में डिस्कस करना पड़ेगा आई थिंक मिश्रा जी ने बहुत छोटे में ब्रीफ कर दिया जो एंड का सेशन था सो आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन एंड अ कॉन्क्रीट सजेशन आई हैव अ कॉन्क्रीट सजेशन एंड आई वांट टू नो व्हाई दिस इज नॉट पॉसिबल जस्ट एन आइडिया यू सी टू गेट अ मोबाइल फोन इन इंडिया यू कैन नॉट हैव इट अनोनिमसली यू कैन नॉट so why couldn't you make a policy that uh, to have a social media ac- ac- account it will only be given to those that the home ministry has verified and get rid of anonymous participation which will be solve 90% of the problem because all this nonsense that people are doing they do it under fake name they do it under anonymous name so just like there's a problem security problem of uh, somebody using a mobile phone anonymously and the government has understood it and said okay you know you can raise hell every all these mobile phone companies in the world raising hell initially that india is putting all this stuff but indian government said this is our law and now nobody talks so why <laughs> couldn't india government do the same thing for social media saying that we will block all social media unless the uh, every person participating has registered with us just like you register with the uh, uh, mobile and then those people can participate and this will have to be registered with the home ministry you know short term they will their market will come down because they they will have to register everybody it will take time but that registration could be a fee like you can charge some few rupees to pay for the cost 
and you will control and you will send the message to the world that we control our rules and we are concerned about national security and all this nonsense of you know teams sitting in foreign countries here and there and doing mischief will have to end so why don't you do that ek second aage mujhe pata hai iska answer sab de sakte hain let me add and then others can add if i missed it sir thankfully government has got this idea and they are in the process of changing the telecom law for which also we have a conference tomorrow okay and in that conference sorry in that law what they have included which is highly debated now is license to ott otts o- over the top platforms which is highly debated and highly objected by everybody except few people like us secondly they have inserted a clause i have a right to know and right to have the id of the person who is calling me through ott whatsapp mm. so only that part is now they have covered but we are hopeful it may extend other things also now rakesh vimal ji and doas sir professor ma ji yeah but but very briefly sir half a minute after ha, after 30 second first first okay okay thank you actually rajiv ji jo aapne pucha iska solution hai jo goal saab wale sab pe solution hai but blockchain have a solution a real solution where decentralization validation can done you don't need even yeah. a government to do that but government can say okay huge blockchain to do this kyc but they can make the they can make the policy yes they can make the policy yeah. and it can be done by technology rakesh ji i just wanted to mention uh, the point rajiv ji uh, mentioned of course uh, here uh, in india we have a tendency to lap up whatever is available free and that is how all this ott platform is taking us for a ride and all this uh, freedom of uh, expression and uh, all that comes from there and he has rightly mentioned if it uh, we, there is a proper registration even if it's a small amount but uh, then there can be a proper track and uh, you know simple thing the way mobile phone uh, has uh, a control same thing this ott platform will also have thank, thank you. you i think uh, i will skip the vote of thanks because i am oversuited by 10 minutes so my thanks to everyone thanks to rajiv and madam Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.